Hello, I'm going to do a little video here on conservation of angular momentum. This will be a little bit different than the others, instead of just doing a screen capture of my iPad, uh, I'm doing a screen casting software on my desktop computer with a webcam so you can see me, for better or for worse. And uh, I'm going to kind of flip back and forth between YouTube video, the uh, whiteboard thing that you see, and uh, this will probably be the format that I try to use more often uh, than not now. So that way you, you, you can see my face. So something's happening when I'm not writing on the screen. Anyways, um, some of the problems that are in your assignments for angular momentum involve conservation of angular momentum. In fact, the last three from the worksheet that I gave you for practice problems. So I want to go through and show how conservation of angular momentum is different than conservation of linear momentum and how they're similar. Uh, so on your screen, you should be able to see here the conservation of linear momentum equation where total momentum linearly before something happens, before some collision, explosion, two things interact with each other, should be constant and carry over to the after the collision or the contact. And in that case, the linear momentum P is equal to mass times velocity, and M is usually a constant value. So the before to after for an object, what changes to make its momentum change is its velocity, either direction, if you're dealing with a, a two-dimensional sort of problem, or in the case of one dimensional something switching directions, but uh, it's either magnitude or direction of the velocity that's normally causing the change of momentum. So if we just do what we've been doing all along for this rotational stuff, and we just swap out the linear quantities or replace it with an angular or rotational quantity, we can say that for multiple objects or even a single object, a conservation of angular momentum means that the total uh, angular momentum before the interaction or change happens is going to equal the total angular momentum afterwards. And so we just swap out the P's and we put in capital L's. Um, so if we take a deeper look at that though, for the angular momentum, there's a big difference. Angular momentum is not just mass times velocity, it's rotational inertia multiplied by the angular velocity, omega, or angular speed. And that means that there's two things that can technically change because omega is the rate of radians per second, depending on which way you're rotating, how many uh, radians per second or degrees per second, if you want to think of it that way, you're going through, that's a variable. But i is also a variable because i depends upon the mass of the object and where the mass is. So if we modify where the mass is, we can modify i. So that leads to an important consideration that for conservation of angular momentum, it's not just velocity that can change, it's also the inertia. So as we'll see with a couple of demonstrations uh, that I've got uh, through video, I've already posted a video for you to look at for the speed skater, sorry, figure skater, and the figure skater manipulating where their arms and legs are, and that can change how quickly they're rotating. That was a quick demonstration. Uh, I'll go and show you another one here right now that you've probably seen before. I was going to do my own live demo, but it's not working in this environment. Maybe we'll post one later. Um, this is from a teacher at the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. Uh, this is posted with Creative Commons, so I'm using the clip right here. I'll, I'll link to their uh, information as well. But you can see the change in angular speed with the change in placement of the masses. So the demonstrator here has the masses far out in the beginning. And when the masses are brought in, the angular speed, the rate of rotation increases. And then he puts them back out, slows rate of rotation, brings them in, increases rate of rotation, and so on. Now it's not perfect. There's always going to be some loss of energy uh, and rotation due to friction. But we can see a distinct situation where the angular velocity is changing without any outside torque. So we're not applying a net torque, getting an angular acceleration, and then getting an angular velocity change. All that's happening is internal to the system, the guy and the two weights, the position is being changed, which initially is decreasing the I value, the rotational inertia. And as that decreases, if the total angular momentum is going to remain constant, product i times omega must be constant as well. Well, if i goes down, omega has to go up. And then he puts his arms back out, 
which raises the I value, and so the omega drops again. So it's a situation where there's a single object undergoing conservation of angular momentum. Uh, pretty straightforward, and there's a couple of problems that I want you to work out like that. What gets a little bit more tricky is when you have multiple objects interacting with each other because it's kind of common for us to take a look at problems where something moving linearly interacts with something that can be rotating and then they both become rotational. And that's there's a little crossover there that gets a bit tricky. So uh, I also have a problem like that on your problem sheet. It's an example from the game Wipeout. But let's take a look here at this idea of collisions. So I've got in this picture uh, mass MA, and that mass MA, let me get a highlighter thing, that make that make it better? Maybe not. There we go. Uh, that mass MA, so I'm dealing with a little bit of lag with my, uh, my uh, iPad writing on it. It's not popping up, just like it does in class, except now it's frustrating because I'm trying to record. But anyways, uh, the mass MA that we've got here is moving with a linear velocity VA, and it's going to strike and hit a stick. We can call it a stick, we can call it a rod, whatever you want. Uh, if it's a rigid rod pivoting about its endpoint, it'd have a rotational inertia we can calculate. Uh, it'd be one third ml squared. Um, and when the mass MA collides and it hits that stick, the stick wants to rotate. So the mass isn't going to continue on, it's going to stick to the rod and then rotate with the rod. So once the mass MA makes contact, it's no longer a linear motion problem. It's a rotational motion problem. Once that mass MA makes contact with the, with the, uh, the rod, mass B, it is now a point mass rotating about a pivot point. So it's no longer uh, just having a linear momentum M times V. It's going to have a angular momentum that's going to be its rotational inertia times its um, angular speed. Or for point mass, go and write it down over here. Initially, we say that for a uh, point mass, the rotational inertia multiplied by the angular velocity would be its uh, angular momentum. But for point mass, we can say that it has m times v times r, and that's going to be its initial angular momentum. Now, once it goes into uh, motion with a stick, it's going to be a point mass mr squared for its rotational inertia with an omega value. So it gets a little complicated, but we could say here, let me scroll down a bit. If this, it's not going to let me scroll down, OK. Uh, Initially, we would have the L for mass A plus the L for mass B. And those would be, for uh, the MA, that would be MA times its velocity VA times the radius it's at, which would be the length of the stick, L. And for the rod, it would be its I value, one third mb times l squared multiplied by zero. Now I know that makes it equal to zero, but I still want to just write it out as an expression. So that's the initial angular momentum of the system. Now once they begin to rotate together, they're stuck together, and we would then say that the total rotational or angular momentum of the system is going to be the total of their two rotational inertias multiplied by their new angular velocity that they have as they rotate together. And again, sorry for the delays and what I'm saying and writing and what's popping up on the screen. But if we had this, we could set these two equal to each other. I could put in that this is uh, for the IA, it would be mass A times the length squared. I'm sorry, I put a multiplication sign there. Uh, it's supposed to be a plus sign. I'm, I just fixed that right here. 
And then for the stick, it would still be 1 third MB times the total length squared. Now, that's not intuitive, but once you try practicing a little bit, it'll be a little bit uh, easier to kind of get. So we've got the total angular momentum of the ball beforehand. We've got the total angular momentum of the rod beforehand. And then we have their combined angular momentum in the end. So that's our setup. Let's go ahead and take a look at it as a uh, numerical problem. And how about you go and see if you can set this up using the numbers I give you and then calculate and see what you get for an answer. All right, I had to uh, go get myself a, a tasty citrus beverage. Uh, I'm uh, back to recording here. <clears throat> so what do we got? Uh, let's go ahead and work this one out together. So I say the clay ball in the above diagram has a mass of 1.5 kilograms and is traveling 2 meters per second. It strikes and sticks to the 0.5 meter long rod, which has a mass of 2 kilograms. What will be their angular velocity of the clay stick system after the collision? So it's a sticky collision, but uh, the sticky collision is not going to be treated as a linear momentum problem. There are problems in uh, physics where if the rod is not allowed to pivot if it can if it's not stuck in place not pivoting around one point if it were able to actually spin through the air then you have to do it as a linear problem and as an angular problem really really complicated we're not going to do those so um, bear with me if the screen isn't updating as i talk but uh, in this case we've already got the equations from up above where the mass a for the clay ball we've got is 1.5 kilograms, and it's moving at two meters per second, and the length of the rod 0.5 meters long. Uh, and yeah, sorry, brain fart there. Um, plus zero for the rod beforehand, and then in the end we've got 1.5 times 0.5 squared plus one third, sorry, I don't need that uh, parentheses there, plus one third uh, times the two kilograms for the stick times the length of the rod squared, and all that is going to be multiplied by an omega. So now it's just a computation problem. Uh, and, geez, I forgot here. I've got a calculator. Let me let me find it real quick. There we go. I knew I had a calculator someplace. I found a TI eighty three plus uh, simulator. So uh, make sure I've got that with me. So we got one point five times two times point five. We get uh, one and a half as the angular momentum beforehand. Uh, then we've got one point five times point five uh, squared. Oh, I got to click a button here. There we go. So 0.375. And then we've got one third times two times 0.5 squared. 0 0.167. And all that's going to be times omega. So if we uh, go ahead and do that 1.5 divided by Oh, it's not letting me do parentheses on the keyboard. I'll do it by hand. This is going to be kind of silly. There we go. I get 2.767, or about 2.77 radians per second. So uh, we'll take a look at some other problems, and uh, I'll kind of post those later.